Hey guys, welcome back to the CNC mill project <clears throat> where I'm installing the Centroid All-in-One DC motion controller. Um, where I'm at now, <clears throat> the back panel is, is stuffed. Um, it's got all the components on it, all my terminal blocks on it, and I'm about ready to wire it. So one of the things I've been doing is I've been studying the print, the schematic sheet for the All-in-One DC. And there are a lot of things on the print <clears throat> that I don't need to use. Uh, they don't apply to my machine. And, um, you know, they try and cover a lot of things to help the user wire up the control. And you'll have to make tweaks and modifications. Um, one thing I should preface this by is that if you have electrical experience and you can read schematics, everything should be relatively smooth sailing for you. If you don't have electrical experience or you're not sure how to read schematics like this, you might have a difficult time and you might miswire something. So, um, Centroid's made it as easy as they can possibly make it. This is a guide for you to, to wire up your control to your particular application, your machine. I'm using the the mill 220, uh, 110 all-in-one DC, uh, 110 volt rectification with a VFD. Um, my servo motors, uh, I think they're they're Glentex, and they just take rectified 110 volt AC. So it's very simple. I don't have a step-down transformer um, to reduce the AC voltage. That once rectified, you know, uh, meets the requirements of the DC brush servos. So anyway, um, you got to know how to read the print. You got to have some basic electrical experience. Basic electronic experience would help as well. If you don't, um, I'd probably think twice about diving into this project without the help of somebody who is knowledgeable and can help you do the project. Um, you know, one thing I hate to see is somebody dive into a project like this and then get lost and now they've got a machine that's no longer functional um, and or you know you damage some of your uh, parts or equipment like the all-in-one DC motion controller um, wiring the machine is up to you it's your responsibility to wire it upright it does not lie on the folks at Centroid so anyway so I've been taking the time to, to kind of review the print and I've X'd out things that don't apply to my machine. And I've been uh, following um, the terminal block and all the wiring that lands on it. And I'm following this print as close as possible because it serves as a reference. And as I go, I'll redline the print, you know, where I put my connections, my wiring, my relays, and so forth. Uh, I'll redline this print and then hopefully. Um, they may have a CAD version of it, so you can take it into your CAD program and you can make permanent changes, and then this print is very unique to your machine. You can take the things off of it that don't apply to you. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as you go. Um, I'm going to try and explain the systems to you as we go. Um, everything from the limit switch circuitry to the e-stop circuitry and so forth. I'm going to try and explain that stuff. We're going to eat this elephant one bite at a time. It, overall it could look, look intimidating and look overwhelming, but we take each system one chunk at a time. So that's the way you need to look at it as well. Um, just kind of, let's go over some key things here. Um, I'm going to try and bring you in a little bit closer to the print. I don't know how well it's going to show up, but you can download this print off of Centroid's uh, website. Um, that way you can follow along or you can study it or you can look at it before you even decide to go into your project and say, yeah, this is for me, yeah, I can do it. Or yeah, I've got a friend that can help me go through it and together we can make it work. So I'm going to try and zoom you in uh, to the, the key components of the print and we'll talk about them. Um, on this side is a legend, so if you're looking for lube pump or notes or uh, spindle break. It gives you a location on the print. It's just like a map. So let's say we were looking for spindle motor. Well, it says A1. So 
you would go you would go to the top these are all here's a down here and then this is six five four and a one is at the top so you follow the the print on the the x-axis is letters and on the y-axis is numbers so if you're looking for something in particular you just look at the table here and then look for the letter and the number and it'll kind of kind of triangulate for you on the print where you need to be so that's that's that part let's uh, talk about the drum switch next okay here's our our drum switch or disconnect switch and I'm using something that's very similar I have a three pole switch I only have one auxiliary contact on mine we're going to use L1 and L2 because I have 240 volts coming in and uh, um, and then we're going to use the aux one auxiliary contact for the AC f for the, uh, the 110 volts for the control itself which also takes care of power to the servo motors the 240 volts will feed the two VFDs and then this this L L3 T3 we won't use and again this uh, 110 volts uh, coming in will feed the control um, in this setup you need uh, a 240 volt circuit and you need a 120 volt circuit so you need two circuits now you could most certainly put in uh, a step down transformer to go from 240 to 110 volts but I think that adds expense and complexity to the project and Centroid's designed it this way I set my machine up my space to have a 240 volt uh, input circuit and a 120 volt input circuit so I've got that covered and then uh, it goes through some fuses and I have fuses on my back panel that you'll see um, shortly but uh, so L1 will go to F2 and L2 goes to F3 we won't use F4 and then 110 volt in on that auxiliary contact goes to F1 and then these go on down so the next thing to look at is let's look at the the e-stop uh, contactor and a flood pump contactor okay CNT1 is an e-stop contactor its coil goes through the all-in-one DC uh, e-stop output um, so if the all-in-one DC or the e-stop button if the e-stop buttons pressed it'll open up this contactor or if the all-in-one DC needs to uh, you know stop the machine for a fault it can open up this contactor and what goes through this contactor basically is uh, the voltage the DC voltage um, that's been rectified from the uh, the capacitor and bridge for the power for the servo motors that's coming in through L4 and L3 and then um, uh, they got a spindle cooling fan going through one of them and then um, Let's see, OCR 295. I'm not 100% sure what this one is. I'll have to trace it out. But anyway, this 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 just breaks, um, breaks uh, you know systems in case of a fault. Um, CNT2. This contactor is for a flood um, coolant pump circuit. Um, I think I will be using it because I do have a three-phase flood coolant pump in the pedestal of my mill so I think I will use it I will not use this OCR2 um, I will be using um, actually that's what this goes through this other one goes through the flood coolant pump so it basically opens up the circuit um, this other this L2 T2 this is OCR295 that drops down to here and then that goes through the coil of CNT2 so it's basically turning off your flood coolant pump when you hit that e-stop relay so you don't got a flood coolant pump running and making a mess out of everything while you're trying to figure out what the heck happened so I will be using CNT2 for my flood coolant pump. That's what CNT2 is. So CNT1 is basically it's called the e-stop relay. CNT2 is a flood coolant um, relay. So we'll be using that. So the next thing is uh, let's go over uh, terminal block one. Okay, terminal block one is kind of the heart of a lot of the wiring in this cabinet. Um, it's broken up into um, sections like uh, and and there are jumpers. You can see the jumpers right here so one through three are jumpered together so essentially TB1 1 2 and 3 are tied together and incidentally this is TB1 terminal block 1 and then this is A and B there are A's in these little circles probably hard for you to see and B's are in these circles 
but it's broken down to 110 volt AC and then uh, hot and then 110 volt neutral and then uh, we get down to the, the the grounds right here and then we got 24 volts uh, DC here and then we've got a couple things like pump alarm loop pump alarm um, and inverter fault um, so anyway let's kind of go through some of these so F1 load well that's coming from our fuse um, from uh, just just past the rotary drum switch um, and then it's going to go out and it's going to feed power supply one that's the power supply that feeds the all-in-one DC and also gives us our 24 volt control circuit um, on the B side here um, looks like it also provides power to the console if you're using console I'm not using a console I'm just going to use a touch screen monitor on my machine um, there's a note here for note 2 if I go take a look at note 2 it talks about the lube pump if you're using a 110 volt lube pump follow this section if you're using a 220 volt lube, lube pump it tells you how to wire it there so that's uh, feeding the lube pump um, this is catboard um, catboard is basically the uh, capacitor bridge setup that rectifies the AC and converts it to DC for the servo motors um, so uh, the uh, the catboard power is coming in here and then it goes out it goes through CNT1 and then it goes on up to the all-in-one DC minus VM and positive VM input for the uh, servo motors and then these are the the neutrals here um, the uh, catboard against the the uh, AC minus door fan AC minus is here and uh, let's see on this side here we got rotary con pin clamp I'm not sure what this is I'd have to look it up here's the lube pump neutral work light neutral um, console neutral power from the console and then this is the neutral for the power supply that feeds the all-in-one DC um, the next one we have here um, these are all just the chassis grounds we got gr as a ground lug for the cabinet you've got a flood pump ground um, power supply ground that's PS1 again that's the uh, the power supply for the all-in-one DC um, console ground lube pump ground all your shields if you have uh, cables with shields in them and they have a drain wire they're all going to come into this um, cable shields um, mist if you have a mist system that has a sh uh, ground it comes in here um, I've I've marked out things that don't pertain to me there's no power supply to in this cabinet so I've marked that out um, moving on down here, this is 24 volts DC. Um, I'm using a 24 volt DC relay to activate my uh, CNT1, my e-stop relay, so I've moved that. They show a 24 volt AC transformer on this print, and I'm not using 24 volt AC. I didn't see the need to add yet another transformer just to activate and deactivate CNT1. So I'm using the 24 volt DC circuit, so I moved, uh, I, you see it handwritten here I've moved it up into the 24 volt DC um, on the other side here's a 24 volt DC going to uh, the inputs the common side of the the inputs on the all-in-one DC board um, and then these are all the returns um, for loop pump alarm so if you have a loop pump that has a float in it to alert the uh, control that you're low on oil uh, way oil this is where the neutral or the, the, the return comes in and then on the all-in-one DC you would hook up the low lube input there and that completes the circuit. Um, inverter fault, same thing. If you have an inverter fault that, that goes up to the VFD and then it's, it's inverter fault goes into the all-in-one DC and if that circuit closes it tells the all-in-one DC that you have a VFD fault. E-stop connector, um, this, this is for the e-stop circuit. Um, if you have a high low range um, a rotary switch uh, say you have a step pulley on your spindle and you want to move the belts you can tell the control which position it's in by by switching that switch so that pretty much covers uh, TB1 this down here this is that 24 volt AC and there was a fuse for that 24 volt AC transformer I've marked it out that I'm, I won't be using that so let's uh, scoot down to the power supply and the uh, catboard right here it says these are located all under the all-in-one DC and there is space under the all-in-one DC for it but I chose 
um, not to utilize that space for this stuff. I, I wanted to be able to get to it. I didn't want to be able to, if I had to service it, I didn't want to have to take the all-in-one DC panel off to get under it and to get to it. That's certainly your choice. There is space under there. It's dead space. You can most certainly use that space for this stuff if you want, but I chose not to. So this is catboard here. So basically, Centroid has a big capacitor and I have a capacitor and on top of it they mount the rectifier. In my case, my previous control had the capacitor and had a rectifier, but the rectifier was mounted to the plate and I chose to mount it to the plate. So anyway, so the assembly basically is this. It's a capacitor and a rectifier. Rectifier, a bridge rectifier basically takes AC and converts it to a very choppy DC and then the capacitor itself filters it out and cleans up the DC. That's oversimplifying, but that's what it does in a nutshell. So on this side of the cap board, it says we're getting our power from TB12A, which is our AC, the positive, and then TB15A, that's the AC negative. It goes in, and on the outside, coming out of it is going to be our rectified DC, and it's going to CNT1, L4 and CNT1L3. That's the contactor, the CNT1 E stop contactor we talked about previously. And then out of that contactor, it goes over to uh, the all in one DC uh, negative VM and positive VM uh, input. That's the uh, DC voltage for the servo motors. And down here is the power supply one. This is uh, the power supply for the all in one DC. Um, so you know, it, it just basically plugs into the all-in-one DC and it's really simple and you know, it is what it is. I don't think there's anything more that we need to talk about there because it just plugs into it other than, you know, where do we get power from and it all goes back to TB1, TB18B, TB14B, TB11B, um, that's where we get in power and then uh, these are going up to the all-in-one DC and so forth. Here's our 24 volts that's going to the uh, TB11A. Uh, so, uh, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. That just gets plugged right in the all-in-one DC and that's that. So that pretty much covers that. There's a, here's, here's, the, here's a neat little table. If you have 110 volts going in and you rectify it directly, you're gonna have 156 volts out. You got 117 going in here, you got 165 out. If you got 120, you're gonna get 170 volt DC out. If you got 125, volts going in here and get 177 out. Well these here you don't know what you're going to get. You don't get to choose from your, you know, from your power company which one you want. So I always plan for the worst. It could be 125 volts. You're going to get 177 volts DC out. You need to make sure that your servo motors are rated for that. I believe mine are rated for 180. So uh, I, I, I'm fine there. If your servo motors are, are less than these values, that they're, I don't know, 100, 100 volts, 110 volts, or 90 volts, you are going to have to use a step-down transformer. Basically, they'll take the AC, this AC input, and it's going to drop it down. You're going to get AC out, but a lower voltage AC out. So by the time it goes through rectification, which it's 1.414, so if you multiply AC times 1.414, that's what you're going to get in DC out. So you need to, depending on your application, I, mine's simple. My servo motors take 100, 180, up to 180 volts DC, so I'm covered. I just got direct rectification. If you have smaller servo motors, you're going to have to use a step-down transformer to get your DC down below the terminal voltage of your DC motor. That covers uh, the PS1, the power supply. It's a Meanwell RQ-65D. It provides plus 12 volts, plus 24 volts, minus 12 volts, um, and a positive 5 volts. Um, so uh, that's that. Um, next, let's go over the all-in-one DC. Okay, the all-in-one DC, we're going to go over the outputs and then the input, the outputs are on the top of the all-in-one DC and the inputs are on the left side, left upper side of the all-in-one DC. Servo motor connection is on the right side, encoders are on the bottom of the all-in-one DC. Um, the PLC, the programmable logic controller of the all-in-one DC is pre-programmed for you. Um, so all these are predefined. These outputs are predefined. These inputs are predefined. If you need to change them, if they, if they need to be changed, they can be changed, but they have to be done in the programmable logic controller um, and reassigned. So it, you have some flexibility there, but I think it takes a little bit of doing. And unfortunately, in my case, these things are kind of pre-set up already for 
most uh, basic knee mill, CNC knee mills, or you know, even the lathe, a basic CNC lathe can use this. It gets more tricky if you have a tool changer. But anyway, let's go over all these. All right, the very first output here is the e-stop circuit. So this, and these relays are fused. Um, I believe it's one through eight are fused with a two amp fuse. And then um, relay nine, I believe has a 10 amp fuse. Let me take a quick look at that. Yeah, output nine has a 10 amp uh, relay and output eight and nine um, are double are single throw double pole relays. That is that they have a normally open and a normally closed and a common uh, to them. The rest of them are just a simple single pole single throw relays. Um, one through seven are single pole single throw. So the first one is the e-stop circuit. So it's basically a relay that if there's a fault it will open the circuit. This, this e-stop relay and the e-stop button are in series with each other and then they go through CNT1. So if the button is pushed, it opens a circuit, CNT1, our e-stop, our e-stop contactor opens, or if there's a fault and all-in-one DC opens this, this output one, it also opens CNT1. Um, the second one here is output two and that's a lube pump. Most loop pumps don't draw very much, so you can run them directly through the all-in-one DC. Um, the next one is flood coolant. Um, again, most flood coolant pumps um, may not draw more than a couple of amps. Usually, in my case, it's less than an amp, but you need to double check that. And if that's the case, you can run it directly through the all-in-one DC and the fuse and the all-in-one DC will protect it. Um, mist, same thing. Um, I'm going to use this mist circuit, but I'm going to use, uh, I'm just going to run 24 volts through it because I'm going to actuate a pneumatic uh, solenoid, uh, an air solenoid. So when this thing closes, it'll turn my solenoid on and I'll have my, my mist coolant there. Um, the next one here is inverter reset. That's the VFD reset. So if there's a fault and you reset, it'll reset the VFD for you. Um, the next one here is a work light. So your work light can run through this, no problem. The next one is spindle um, uh, enable. Um, so this is output seven is spindle enable. And then the next one is spindle direction. This is where we're using that single pole double throw. In one direction, we're going spindle forward. And when that relay goes the other way, it goes into spindle reverse. The last one is a spindle break. That's the one that they happen to have uh, assigned to output nine. And you know, if you have a large spindle break, well, it's definitely got plenty of fuse and contact there to control it. Um, so um, that covers the outputs. Let's go over to um, this side, the left side. This top one here is our, our um, VFD signal output. This is the zero to 10 volts that our VFD needs to control its spindle, to control the spindle speed. So that, that's going to get tied there. And let me move the camera down. We'll go over all the inputs and we'll discuss the resistors. Okay. So make sure you read the manual, but uh, especially here, because these inputs, there are blocks. And these blocks of four um, what I mean by assignable means the voltage that they can operate at. You can, I believe the three are 5 volts, 12 volts, and 24 volts. I'm leaving mine all at 24 volts because that's I'm using 24 volts for my signal circuitry. So depending on what voltage you use on these blocks of, of inputs, you have to change a, a resistor pack. It's a SIP, single inline package. So the manual tells you, and, and the, the all-in-one DC comes with the SIP resistors, depending on the voltage you're going to use. So um, it, it, I don't see it on the sheet here that tells you which one to use, but the manual does, the installation manual just does tell you. So make sure you put the right, you plug in the right resistor pack, uh, given the voltage that you're going to be working with um, for your inputs. Again, uh, you know, if you can keep it simple, just, just go with 24 volts DC and just leave them all at that. If you have, if you have to use like a proximity sensor and it uses five volts, then by all means, you know, go with that. But my, my advice to you is keep it simple, stick with one voltage and change all the SIPs to that particular voltage. So here, let's start with input one. It goes input one through 16. This is our X minus limit switch. 
x plus limit switch, y minus limit, y plus, z minus, z plus, um, rotary connector, um, home. Um, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I'll, I'll look for it. I don't think it's something I'll be using. Um, lube pump alarm, this is the, the signal to the all-in-one DC that if your, your, your uh, lube pump has a float switch that detects when you're low on oil, this is where that signal goes in. Inverter fault, if the inverter sees a fault or it goes into fault mode, it'll, it'll input here to input 10 and it'll put the all-in-one DC in a fault condition and stop. And then this is your e-stop OK. Um, the e-stop button has two contacts. One of them we talked about already that's tied with this uh, e-stop output circuitry. And then the other one is a direct signal into the all-in-one DC uh, e-stop. All right, let's talk about the e-stop button and the e-stop circuit. Here's your e-stop switch right here. It has two sets of contacts on them, both of them normally closed. One of them tells the all-in-one DC whether it's an e-stop or it's a normal. When it's a normal, the circuit is closed and there's a continuous loop from 24 volt ground to the e-stop uh, e input, which is on terminal uh, 11, H1011. And then the other one, this comes out of the all-in-one DC, the e-stop relay circuit, comes out of the all-in-one DC, it's basically going through here and then it goes to that CNT1 coil contactor coil and then that goes to uh, um, ground I believe. It de-energizes CNT1 or the all-in-one DC can de-energize CNT1. So this button is serving two purposes. One is a direct signal into all-in-one DC saying hey the stop circuit is okay means it's in the normal state, normally closed state or the button's pushed and it goes normally open tells all-in-one DC we have an the e-stop button has been pressed and the other side of it is part of the CNT1 is opening up CNT1 and anything that's uh, connected to that relay including the the voltage to the servo motors it opens that up if there's an e-stop press so that pretty much sums up the e-stop circuit that pretty much covers all the, uh, the the assignments for the inputs on the all-in-one DC we can, go, we can go down here a little bit. Let me pan down a little bit and we'll talk about these connectors um, on the lower, lower left side of the all-in-one DC. These are limit defeaters. If you don't have limit switches for some reason or another, you would use these switches to defeat that. You know, you're not using limit switches. In some machines, that might be the case. Um, here's your Ethernet port. This is a probe cable, so if you're using, if you're using a probe from uh, Centroid, you plug it in there. These are PLC add-on connectors here. Um, this is if you need more I.O., you want to expand your I.O., say you have a tool changer, an ATC or something like that. This is where you'd plug them in. This next one says operator control panel. The operator control panel, um, Centroid has their jog panel. Um, and this is where you would plug that cable into it. The jog panel has, you know, you can, you can move the axis around. You can, it has auxiliary buttons on it. Um, if you go to their website, you'll see their jog panel. Um, so that's where it will get plugged in. And then manual pulse generator. This is where this gets plugged. Manual pulse generator, if you have the hand wheel, that's where it gets plugged into. There's a schematic down below. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, the, the encoder inputs for the servo motors, they, go, they plug in here. Um, spindle encoder cable will plug in encoder 6 and uh, this drive com out if you have to have a fourth or fifth or sixth axis you would plug those boards that get daisy chained on on here um, that about covers the all-in-one DC um, we can drop down to the MPG connector all right this is the MPG connector which is, stands for manual pulse generator it's a hand wheel basically and a hand wheel is basically just an encoder typically it's got 100 counts per revolution and every tick of that hand wheel is one pulse um, so it gets th this is the schematic for it now you could build your own you know you could pick up your own manual pulse generator and use it and wire it for the schematic provided it's a 5 volt and it's a differential type manual pulse generator meaning it has a positive A, a negative A, a positive B, a negative B output um, and it's a 5 volt as I previously mentioned 
So you, you could get that and then you could wire the switches. Um, if you have MPG times one, times 10, times 100, here's where you'd write, wire those switches. If you need an LED to let you know that it's on, you could put that in there. And then which axis, one, two, three, you know, X, Y, Z. If you had an A axis, you could put it on four. So it gives you everything that you need there. And, and here's the connector pin out. This is the part that plugs in to the all-in-one DC. Now, you know, that said, that's, it's a lot of work. And uh, actually, I, I was looking at Centroid's website. That, their manual pulse generator is priced pretty competitively when you consider, you know, all the work in, in uh, wiring it up and making sure you get it right. So, you know, I'd suggest just, you might just buy it from uh, Centroid. It's, it's, it's pretty reasonably priced, so you might go that route. Um, let's swing over to their consoles. As I previously mentioned, I'm not using a console. I'm just going to use a touchscreen uh, touch monitor, and uh, Centroid is going to be coming out with something called a virtual jog panel, and it's going to basically have their jog panel virtually on the screen. So a touch screen is, I think it's, I highly recommend that you find a touch screen monitor or you buy an all-in-one PC with a touch screen. Um, make sure the PC that you buy meets the minimum uh, requirements, which basically you need a three gigahertz or faster processor, whether it's a Celeron, uh, an Intel i3 or an Intel i5, it's got to be three gigahertz or faster four gigabytes of memory and 120 gig minimum solid state hard drive for reliability. But these are the consoles. So if you elect or you end up with a console, this is how they're wired up. This is without a PC in it, meaning the PC is probably down in the control cabinet. And this is with a PC. And they, they like using the Intel Nook. It's a great little PC. It's very, it's very small and compact. But they, you could put this Nook in behind the, uh, in the console itself. So that kind of covers their, their, two, uh, their two consoles. I think that pretty much covers the, the print. Um, again, there are some other things on here that, you know, they may or may not apply there. It could be informational. Oh, the other thing we got to talk about is snubbers on uh, relay coils. Uh, let's go to CNT1 and we'll talk about a snubber. Okay, here's CNT1 and here's the actual coil of the relay and then you see this little device above it. This is called a, a snubber. And um, all contactor require, coils require a snubber, either the contactor manufacturer's recommended snap-on snubber or Centroid part number 1819 um, external quench arc snubber. Um, they go across the coils. So they're, they're kind of suppressors and uh, they help with noise. So Centroid wants you to put these snubbers, whether it's AC or DC, you use the quench arc across your coils. On, on any of the relays that you use in your control cabinet. Okay, that pretty much covers an overview of the schematic. And uh, we're gonna eat this elephant one bite at a time, like I mentioned previously. We're gonna work on subsystems within the control cabinet and we're gonna test them. That's what I try and like to do. So we'll start with wiring up the drum switch and getting power in there. Um, I have a, a start stop contactor, we'll wire that in, get that working, and then we'll work to the fuse block, and then we'll slowly start working into each one of these systems, and we'll try and complete them one at a time, and we'll test them as we go, so that we know that that's, that subsystem is, is complete and working, and then we'll just work our way through the whole project. Um, that's the way I like to do it. Otherwise, if you try and wire everything up, and then you try and fire everything up, then you're chasing a whole bunch of different problems. So I think it's better just to do you know, one system at a time and test it and, uh, you know, see that it's working okay. So, you know, hopefully I haven't scared you off. Um, it's a doable project. Um, if you have basic electrical experience and some electronic experience, uh, or you know somebody that can help you out, uh, it's a very doable project and you can modernize your, your CNC machine to something with a much better control, much more modern control. Um, that, and much more flexible um, and more robust than what you had previously. And that's what I'm doing with this machine. Um, it, it had a Mitutoyo Millstar control before, it was PC based, but the software had a lot, lot to be desired. So, and it was in such wonderful condition, I thought it was worth the money to invest to put in a really good control. And, uh, the next step is to start wiring up that back panel and, and start uh, testing out subsystems.